This is Steve from Pixelbump.com. So we're going to try something different here over the next few weeks. And instead of showing you one effect or one idea from something I've made, I thought it might be more fun to show an entire pipeline of how something gets made, combining as many technologies as I could into a larger pipeline. So I'm going to break this up over four weeks. And each week we're going to tackle one section of how this film got made. In week one, we're gonna talk about concept through production, including the shooting, editing, and prep for visual effects for this film. In week two, we're gonna talk about the modeling and texturing of all the assets, set up for a file structure and reference structure that's gonna allow us to do quick and easy editing of those assets down a pipeline. In week three, we're gonna tackle animation and simulation. We're gonna develop particle systems for fume effects and for our squid particles. We're gonna do soft body rigging and we're gonna look at creating an entire ocean using real flow. In week four, we're gonna to tie together all of our 3D with renders from Arnold and Krakatoa and then bringing them all together for compositing and after effects. Now, strangely enough, four weeks is still not a lot of time for everything we're gonna to have to tackle. So let's dig in. So let's start with the concept. I really love Cthulhu, I love HP Lovecraft, and I've always wanted to see Cthulhu brought to the screen. And strangely enough, he never really has been, not in the way that he was talked about in any of the HP Lovecraft stories. I feel like the closest we got was at the end of Cabin in the Woods, when they're talking about the old gods rising and I kept really thinking we were gonna see Cthulhu. And then at the end, it was just a giant monster hand. and. I really wanted to see Cthulhu there, so I've decided to make something that finally gives me Cthulhu in a film. But I knew that would be a big undertaking to show something with visual effects on that scale. So I thought it was also a great opportunity to show this larger pipeline, how you can tie together different technologies, how to set up file structures so that you can work with other artists simultaneously on the same project. And it could tie together a lot of the different technologies that we've been talking about over the past few months. Now, when you're developing a story, there's really no right or wrong way to do it. The way that you create is the way that you create. And I'm not telling you that there's a better or worse way. Your process is your process. I'm just gonna tell you how my process works. And if anything helps you out, that's great. So for me, it usually starts with an image in my head. I'll see something in my head that I think is gonna make a great shot and I start sketching it out. Now, I just recently got the Samsung Note 4 and one of the nice things about it is it comes with a stylus. So I now have a little Wacom tablet with me wherever I go. And I was able to sit down and start sketching out little ideas as I was developing them for the film. When I started seeing pretty clearly what I was gonna to need to build, I started looking for real world reference. And one of the things that kept coming to my mind is this scene here at the end of the film, Mama, where there's this big spooky cliff overlooking a lake for the climactic scene. 
and I liked a lot of the idea of this, but I didn't want to replicate this look. I definitely wanted to make something of my own. The other image I use as a touch point is this one. I did a search on Cthulhu just to see what are the different representations of him, what kind of ways have different artists imagined him, and I saw this one where I said, hey, there's a little cliff, it's overlooking a stormy sea. Not quite the look I wanted to go for, but what it gave me were the idea of these giant tentacles reaching out from under the water. I thought that was a really brilliant little idea, and I wanted to capture some of that in motion in the film. Once I had the concept images set in my head, I started building out a few assets ahead of the shoot. And I did this, one, to just kind of test out the different things I was gonna make, but also I knew that once I was bringing an actor in, I was gonna have to describe a world that had only been seen in my head. And the more pre-production artwork I could create, the easier it would be for the actor to imagine the world I was gonna place her in. So by the time Najara actually came in, I had, this sequence here at the end in a rough animation form. And here you can see Cthulhu rise up out of where the water will be. You can see the tentacles animating, and you can kind of see the early phase of what this became. Animation is completely wrong at this point, but at least it gave Najara something to look at and understand where I was going. Now we're gonna show more of these assets and how these were created next week. This is just to give you an idea of where I'd gotten to by the time we had started filming. So I knew right away this was gonna be a production that would be completely shot on a green screen. So in preparation, I knew I needed a better green screen. I've been using a large pop-out green screen for a lot of my green screen work for the past few years, but I knew that because of the angles I was gonna to wanna to get, it wasn't really gonna serve me very well. And on Amazon, I found this, the Square Perfect 3065. And it was $95 for a 10 by 20 green screen, the rods, and a carrying case. Now this is a pretty standard, inexpensive green screen. And if you're looking for something a little larger to shoot your own projects, it's worked out great for me and I highly, highly recommend it. A good practice to get into when shooting a green screen is to make sure that it's as even as possible at the outset of shooting. So what I do is set up the green screen and I have two large fluorescent lights on either side. These two fluorescent lights each put off the equivalent of 1500 watts of light through a traditional tungsten lamp. And that was gonna give me a lot of illumination to not only light up the green screen, but if I position them at a little bit of an angle, I could also get a bit of backlight pushing straight onto Najara as well. Now I was fortunate enough to be able to shoot with a wonderful actress on this project. Her name's Najara Townsend, and you may have seen her recently in the film Contracted, where she played a very emotional zombie. And I thought it would be nice to be able to give Najara a little voice in this, so I sat her down for a short interview where she could talk about her experiences working on a green screen for the first time. <laughs> so have you ever worked on a film shot completely on a green screen before? No, never. And was that a uh, an idea that excited you as a different way to work? Yeah, it was it was um, it was definitely an opportunity I have never had and I was always curious about. Um, so it was definitely a, a cool a cool experience. And what did you find different about shooting on a green screen versus being on a practical set? Um, I mean, a lot of it was different. Right. The uh, you're you don't have surroundings necessarily like you don't have real surroundings so that was um that's one whole obstacle right. um and then the pace that we moved at was much faster right. um yeah it was it was a lot of it was different I mean, did you find any of that difficult because i know a lot of actors like you get very kind of into a rhythm of like okay i'm going to pick up this prop at this point and then i'm going to you know, lean against this wall or so, you know, so you kind of tie it to the environment. A lot of performance can get tied to the environment. Yeah. And in this case, you have no environment to tie anything to. Yeah, totally. <laughs> and did, I mean, was that uh, difficult for you to, to get your head around or was that an easy transition? Um, at first it was, it was definitely, I mean, that first take I had to, I just had to work out in my head how this was, I, I didn't know how it was gonna go. 
Um, and then once we started moving, it, it, it became easier. Um, but it was, it was definitely different having to imagine it all and imagine it all. Right. Period. And in the direction that I gave you, did you feel that I gave you enough direction or not enough direction in helping you understand kind of what was happening at each moment? I thought it, the amount of direction was, was perfect really, um, because I got to see the pre-production that you had worked on. So I had an idea of what the world looked like right. um, and what the tentacles looked like, what was what was going on to me. Mm -hmm. um, and then once we were on set, you the communication was good. If I had any questions, you were able to answer them. So that was all very beneficial. Yeah. Um, you know, a lot of times they, you see interviews with actors where they're like, you know, they, I'm just acting with a damn tennis ball on a stick yeah. kind of a thing. I mean, did you feel anything like that where you're like, you know, it, did it feel ridiculous in any of the moments? Yeah, I mean, at first it always feels a little insane, um, but you just have to let go and completely commit to what's going on or else it won't work. Right. So, um, so I, definitely after that first take, I was like, okay, this is my world. <laughs> I'm in it. Uh, let's it's how let's have fun. There's a you 400 know? foot monster coming for me. <laughs> yeah. Hey. <laughs> um, did you enjoy the, the the rapid pace of green screen shooting? Because you know normally on a set you got you know a, a short a few short takes and then there's a break while they move the camera, yeah. reset the lights. In this case, we didn't have to do any of that, so I just kept the kept rolling, kept rolling, kept rolling. Was that pace? good for you or did you find it that you were kind of having a hard time keeping up with it? In this case, it was good for me. I liked it um, because it was, I mean, it was only me in this world. So being able to just keep going um, mm -hmm. and, and not change camera angles, but just change my angle right. was good. Um, had it been like a different story where there was multiple actors and dialogue, then it m might have been more difficult, right. but um, but for this particular thing, it, it was it was kind of awesome. Good. <laughs> it was kind of really cool. <laughs> and do you have any thoughts or advice that you could give to somebody who's maybe trying green screen with an actor for the first time, either to the director or to the actor to help them kind of you know make the best shoot they can? Yeah, um, for the director, I mean to give as much information about the world that the actor is in as possible is mm -hmm. is the best is the best thing um, whether it's like visually storyboards any production you have and then just talking about it and answering any questions and making sure you guys are on the same page world wise right. because it is it is for the I mean for the actor it's all in our imagination and you know what's in your head right. so it's just about blending that and then for the actor I mean just commit to it. Don't. It's gonna feel a little ridiculous, and you just get over it. <laughs> so once we had all the footage shot, it was time to head into post production and start cutting the film together. My workflow is to use Premiere for my editing. I like Premiere because of its super tight integration with After Effects, but it also has some amazing tools and capabilities that just make it a wonderful editor to work with. One of the greatest is that you can bring in any media from any source and play it natively in the timeline without conversion. For those of you who are used to Final Cut, this is a huge time saver in your workflow because it completely removes the need to transcode any footage. Once I'd brought all my footage into Premiere, it was all coming in at the original 5994 frames per second, which we shot with. Now, if we look at that clip here in our footage window, you can see it's completely in regular motion and it has that very high frame rate look a little bit like Peter Jackson's The Hobbit which isn't what I wanted for this film now changing the frame rate in Premiere is really simple you right click on your footage you come up to modify interpret footage and you have frame rates to choose from you can either use the original frame rate or you can tell it what frame rate you want it to be so I chose 23976 and you hit OK. And now I'm going to go back. Let me drag this out, make sure I got enough space here. And you can see now we have beautiful slow motion, giving it a wonderful dreamlike state. 
And you don't have to do that one clip at a time. I can come in, highlight all the clips in my bin, go over to modify interpret footage, and I can change the frame rate for all of them at the exact same time. Once I had the footage all converted to 23976, it was time to start editing. One thing that I like to do for pieces like this is to think a lot about the music because the music is gonna influence the cut quite a bit. There's no dialogue and there's not a lot of matching action that's gonna dictate the pace of the cuts. So I wanted to find some music that I could cut to that would help me develop the feel of the piece. And what I use to find my music is this website called Audio Blocks. You may have seen Video Blocks and it is a stock video and After Effects template site. Well, this is their audio section that they broke off recently. And when the audio was a part of Video Blocks, it was a little anemic and not super useful. But now that it's its own website, they seem to have really added a lot to it. It's become much more robust and has become my favorite way to find new music and sound effects for any production I'm working on. The nice thing is everything here is completely royalty free, meaning you can put it in any production that you make as long as you have your membership. So let's take a quick look at a few of the shots with our temp track to see how that edit developed. And here again, you can see that fan just off the green screen, giving us just a little extra real world influence for the atmospherics of the film. I think that the little bit of hair blowing actually went a long way into selling a lot of these effects. And again, you can see here how even that green screen is and how much easier that's gonna to be to key when it comes down to it. Now, I didn't have enough light to really blank out the bottom here. I didn't have anything sharp from overhead. But since there's only a few shots of that and they're generally from far away, I wasn't too worried about it. As long as I was getting a really good even key across her back mid torso area, I knew that we were gonna be okay. So you can see with a lot of these shots that they were filmed in a much larger scale than they ended up being in the film. And that was okay because I knew that if I had the angle of perspective correct, I could resize it later in After Effects to be able to give me the exact framing I had in my head. So a shot like this would eventually become a shot like this with the exact same shot being used and just changing the scale, but matching the perspective. Now, like I said, my other favorite thing about Premiere is the tight integration to After Effects. So getting this over to an After Effects project became really, really simple. Once I had my edit locked, I could just highlight all my footage, right click, and replace with an After Effects composition. So I click that, After Effects pops up, And here is my edit completely in After Effects, ready for me to start working with it. Now a nice little time saver for once your shots are all in and getting them into their own individual comps so each one can be worked on separately is a script from Video Copilot called Trim Compose. You can download that over at videocopilot.com. It works really great for visual effects workflows because you can highlight your footage Hit Trim Compose, asks you for a folder name, if you would like any handles, in this case I don't, and pretty instantly the script gives you individual comps that are available for you to work with. Now all I need to do is come into them, reveal the layer source in project. It brings me to the comp and I can call this one Shot 1, reveal again, Shot 2, etc. until I have all my shots laid out and ready for VFX. Now that we've got all our footage in After Effects and ready for compositing, we're going to break for today. And next week, we're going to start looking 
at asset creation, creating the cliff, the trees, tentacles, ground cover, and how we're gonna texture all of these in Arnold to give us a beautiful photo reel look. Then again, in two weeks, we're gonna take a look at animation of the assets, simulation of a real flow ocean, particle systems, soft body dynamics, and then finally in week four, we're gonna wrap it all up with rendering and compositing. I hope you've enjoyed today's tutorial and I hope you've learned something you can use in your work. If you have any questions, you can always hit me up on Twitter or Facebook, Google Plus, down in the comments, or you can send up some smoke signals. I'm always on the lookout. Thank you so much for watching. Go and create.